Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started. So lab one was released uh, in the last lecture. Hopefully you are enjoying working on the uh, pruning lab. Uh, we have office hour after today's lecture. Feel free to talk to us. So today we are going to jump into a new chapter from pruning to quantization. So as you remember, pruning reduces the number of weights, right? Have fewer number of weights, 10% of the weights. Now we want to reduce the number of bits for each weight, right? So the total number of storage required for those weights equal to the number of bits, uh, the number of bits per weight times the number of weights, right? So uh, there are orthogonal techniques uh, actually quite important for modern deep learning computing. Um, if you're running um, some AI applications on the phone, it's very likely it is using the quantization technique. So we are going to introduce uh, the quantization in this lecture. We have two lectures covering uh, quantization. In this lecture, we'll first uh, talk about the data types from integers, floating points, what is FP16, what is B float 16, what is the more, uh, the newer like FP8, FP4, how do we represent them and what's the Difference between integer and when integer is better, when floating point is better, super important. Um, and also, we are going to implement the home in the homework um, lab four, lab five, running Lama two on the laptop. We are going to use those concepts. And then we are going to uh, talk about different concepts so neural net quantization for the weights for the activations, and then learn about two con uh, two quantization approaches. One is the uh, k-means-based quantization, which you're going to see that in the homework, and also in the Lama 2 uh, that, uh, laptop uh, demo. Uh, we are going to run by the end of this semester after we complete the homework. There's some subtle difference, k-means versus no k-means, but decoding share the similar characteristic, perfect fit for memory-bounded applications like real-time um, large language model uh, generation in the generation phase. Okay, following that, we are going to discuss about linear quantization, very widely used these days. 8 bit, 4 bit, Qualcomm, NVIDIA, Google, they all support uh, different variants of such linear quantization. And if we have time, next lecture, we are going to talk about binary and also ternary quantization. So, uh, quantization basically turns a continuous signal. So, this is time. This is the strength of the signal. It used to be continuous, right? You can get any value from uh, the mean to max. But now we give only a uh, few choices, like here, one, two, three, four, five, only five choices. Turn a continuous signal into a discrete signal. The value could either be one of uh, these uh, four, uh, actually, one, two, three, four, or five is here. Uh, one of these four, five, four or five values in this case. And what's the motivation for quantization? Certainly, we want to make it cheaper, right? Make the storage cheaper, make the memory reference cheaper, and also make the arithmetic cheaper. Uh, storage is easier to understand the number of bits, uh, the number of parameters times the bit width per parameter, right? So how about operation? Um, for example, the 8-bit versus 32-bit add, um, the energy differs quite significantly. Um, uh, gross, uh, the, the energy decreases linear uh, with the, uh, the, the number of bits when you are doing add. What about multiplication from 8-bit uh, to 32-bit? Uh, uh, is it ON or ON square? The energy. So it's square, right? So it's four times larger, right? But it's almost 16 times uh, more energy because doing uh, multiplication, the amount of uh, work you have to do is actually um, uh, quadratic from uh, 16 bit to 32 bit is also roughly four times, not exactly four times because we are going to talk about the details about floating point operation. So to make deep learning more efficient, quantization is a quite a helpful approach. 
So having the motivation, let's just first jump into how do we represent the numbers? What are the popular representations, integers, floating point, et cetera? And let's start with the simple case, the integer uh, representation, uh, including I assigned integer, other signed integer, and also two's complement representation. If you have learned 6004, this must be very familiar with or familiar. Uh, the lowest bit is 2 to the power of 0 to the power of 1 to the power of 2. And you can sum them up to find uh, the representation of a unsigned integer. So signed integer basically allocates one bit as a sign bit, indicating whether this, this is a positive number or a negative number. And for the remaining bits, again, you sum them up. Um, to get the value. And here we have, uh, we, we are wasting actually one slot since both all zero and one followed by all zero represent zero. So we wasted one slot. And how do we deal with that? Uh, we have this two complement representation. Okay. So the first bit no longer is no longer the sign bit, but it, it is indicating uh, to uh, minus uh, to the power of the largest one. Okay, so if the first one is one, of course it's still a negative number, but the representation would be followed in this equation. Uh, this value would be negative. So in this case, all zero represents zero. One zero 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 is representing the smallest value, which is minus to the power of the minus one. So we also want to um, represent um, fixed point numbers. It may not be an integer, but, but it could be something like 3.0625. Uh, right? And how do we represent that? So we divide um, it by a decimal point. So to the left of, of the decimal point, um, each bit represents 2 to the power, two to power of 0, power of 1, power of 2, but to the right, of that decimal point uh, that is to the power of minus one to the power of minus two, etc. So with uh, this representation, um, which uh, it, we can uh, calculate the representation since this is um, using the original um, um, representation, but we can shift it uh, by two to the power of minus four. Okay, since we are shifting it by four bits. Uh, and you can see using both methods, we can calculate the final representation to have the same value. Okay, you can either use it this way, where this one um, means two to the power of zero, or using this approach, where this bit means two to the power of eight, uh, two to the power of four, since this is the uh, fourth entry from zero, one, two, three, four. So, so far, uh, still pretty simple. And now let's jump into the interesting part, the floating point number. Uh, you may have heard of FP16, B float 16. Um, I mean, it also has this B float 32, uh, FP8, what are they? So let's start with the um, most canonical 32 bit floating point number in IEEE uh, 754. So FP32 has three parts. Okay, the first part is the sign bit, just one bit. And then we have eight bit of exponent and 23 bit of fraction. It's also called significant or mantisa. Okay. So put them together, 23 plus eight plus one, how many? 32, right? 32 bit. How is the number represented here? Sign bit again is minus one um, to the power of sine bit. So if it is one, then it's a negative number. If it is zero, then it's a positive number. And it's one plus this fraction, okay? Why do we have this one? Since we give you a, a free lunch um, to take advantage of always use this representation. But there is a catch we're gonna introduce later about subnormal bits. So, so far, let's assume this is uh, the representation. One plus fraction times two to the power of exponent minus this bias. Okay. So um, these eight bits actually appear um, 
two to the power of exponent, right? So ex extending the range you can represent. Remember in the uh, integer uh, representation, everything is linear, right? So, so now we are not only linear, but we have a much larger dynamic range. Okay? Dynamic range means what is the small difference between the smallest and largest value we can represent. Like we wanna have a larger dynamic range, therefore we put uh, the exponent at the head of to the power of the you know, exponent minus this bias. And what is this bias? Actually, uh, for using 8 bit, we can represent what kind of range can we represent from 0 to 255. And we are using the middle point as the bias. So we are using uh, 127 as the bias. And 127 is actually the largest number we can represent using seven bits. Okay, so the easy way to represent uh, to remember is whenever how many bits you have for the exponent, just n minus one is the bias. Okay, so that you have both um, you can have both the positive uh, uh, actual exponent and also the negative actual exponent. If that, that's too abstract, let's see a concrete example. How to represent? 0 0.265625. So we can uh, divide it into this kind of format, right? Uh, so sine bit is zero since it's a positive number. And it's um, one plus fraction. So one plus fraction, one point fra fraction times two to the power of minus two. Okay, minus two equal to? 125 minus the bias, 127. The bias is fixed as long as you have eight bits of exponent, right? Um, so we are going to use 125 um, for the exponent and also using 0 0.0625 for the, um, for the fraction, for the part, for the significant, for the Malteser, they are the same thing. So this is 0, uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.125, um, and 0 0.02, uh, 0 0.0625. Okay, so uh, each one is half of its previous value. Okay, now we can decode from uh, decimal to uh, FP32. Any questions here before we move forward? If you want to represent zero, can you represent? No, we are going to introduce how to represent zero. Good point. Keep put it as a question mark so far. And how do we represent zero? <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. So we have some special case, right? We want to uh, both represent zero and also represent small numbers, right? Um, so. Um, if the exponents, if they're all zero, it should have been following this um, the same equation as when the exponent is non-zero, right? It's called normal numbers where exponent doesn't equal to zero. And we define in um, this IEEE 754, uh, 754, when the exponent equal to zero, Okay, the equation should be like this. It's no longer one plus fraction uh, times to the power of something, with which if the fraction is zero, you have a one, you cannot represent zero, right? But now we force it to be using another equation, which is fraction. It's no longer one plus equation, fraction, it's just fraction, okay? Times to the power of one minus the bias. Okay, it used to be uh, if it is zero, it should be zero minus the bias, but we just force it to be one minus the bias so that uh, the value is contiguous. Um, using this representation, we can actually uh, represent zero. Okay, if fraction um, is zero, uh, you think, first of all, the exponent has to be zero to follow this equation, right? If the exponent is not zero, we have to follow this equation. If the exponent is zero, and also if the fraction is all zero, then we represent zero. 
So this is called subnormal numbers by using a, a special representation. What is special about this case? The exponent is fixed to be one. Okay? So you have only one degree of freedom here, which is a fraction. And the fraction is linear. It's no longer exponent. So the distance between each centroid you can represent is now linear. It's very similar to integer in this case. So let's see, what is the smallest positive subnormal value? Subnormal means um, the exponent is zero. Of course, um, we set the lowest bit to be one, okay? And um, in order to make it a subnormal number, all the exponent has to be zero, okay? So in this case, this, two to, uh, this is two to the power of minus 23, since we have 23 bits. So this is two to the power of minus one, two to the power of minus two, and this is two to the power of minus 23. So put the fraction here to the power of minus 23, and then we have the last term, which is uh, to the power of one minus the bias. The bias is 127. So this is to the power of minus 126. You multiply them together, actually, this is a quite small number. So to the power of minus 149. So the take home is that in computer system, you cannot represent infinitely small number. Right, so this is the smallest number we can represent using FP32. Okay, so when you are dividing something, you have to be very careful about the numerical stability. Um, we cannot represent infinitely small number. What about the largest positive subnormal value? Give you one minute to think about it. We just cover everything to be one, right? In order to be a subnormal value, everything in the exponent has to be zero. Okay, so we can only have those, um, the rest of the number to be all one. So to the power of minus one here, to the power of minus two, all the way to the power of minus 23. We sum up them together. That is one, my, um, one minus to the power of minus 23. Um, so we put together this um, um, exponent, uh, put together uh, this, uh, this total power of one minus the bias, and we multiply them together. This is the small, uh, this is the largest positive subnormal value we can represent in FE32. Uh, what about other case, two other cases? We talk about subnormal value where um, all the exponents are zero. What about all the exponents are one? So we define uh, the case where all the uh, exponent bits are one, but if every fraction bit is zero, we use it to represent the positive infinity. And if all the fraction bits are zero, we use it to represent negative infinity. And you may find uh, not a number NAN when you are using either Python or MATLAB, which we hate them. How is that represented? So if, if all the um, exponents bits are one, but um, the Mantisa or the fraction bit are non zero, okay, or non zero, this is zero, but this is non zero, that corresponds to the not a number, none. So we can see uh, we are wasting lots of slots, okay? No matter what they are, as long as they are non-zero, non this is not a number, okay? We're going to revisit this using FP8, where we cannot afford so much waste. So we can define a new, uh, new rules for this case. Okay, so let's now put them together. Uh, this is probably the most hol uh, holistic um, chart about IP uh, 32. First of all, using the normal case, 
in red and subnormal case in um, either the first part or the uh, subnormal case versus the uh, an infinite versus not a number case. So in the normal case, um, the exponent is neither zero nor the largest value nor 255 since we have eight bits. Okay. In that case, uh, the equation would be minus one to the power of the sine bit, one plus fraction to the power of the exponent minus the bias. And the bias is represented by, uh, if you have eight bits, that's uh, the largest number that seven bits can represent. Okay. But if you are in the subnormal case, the fraction bit, uh, the exponent bit has to be, uh, has to be zero. Okay. The exponent bit has to be zero. And um, when the, uh, the equation would be, uh, there's no longer one plus fraction, but just fraction. Uh, but if all the exponent bit are all ones, and two scenarios, either the fraction bit, they are all zero versus then it is either positive or ne negative infinite. Or if the fraction bits are not all zero, then uh, it's not a number. And then we can see on the bottom, you can see two ranges. Okay? First one, uh, which is the subnormal value. Okay? And the distance between each centroid is a constant. Okay, because um, here, um, using right here is linear. Okay, versus the normal value, the distance are getting larger and larger. That is because you have this exponent uh, to the power of exponent is making here uh, larger and larger, and that's exactly what we want to expand the dynamic range. And during training of deep neural networks, especially in the first couple of iterations. The neural network is highly turbulent, and sometimes the gradient, when you are calculating the gradient, the number can get quite large. So that's why this large dynamic range is very helpful for training. So we introduced this 32-bit FP32 number representation, which has eight exponent bits, 23 fraction bits, and one bit of sine bit, so totally 32 bits. And roughly uh, five or six years ago, people start to think about, can we use fewer number of bits to train neural networks? Okay, so we have this FP16, which has five bits of exponents compared with eight bits of exponents and 10 bits of fraction. Okay, so five plus 10 plus one, <laughs> Altogether, you have 16 bits, okay? But now you have much smaller dynamic range since the exponent, pretty much the exponent determines your dynamic range and um, the, the fraction base determines the precision. So Google came, came with a smarter representation to take advantage of the high dynamic range of IP32 but only use the total cost of 13 as uh, 16 bit, same as IP16, to save half of the storage. Okay, so that they use this BF16, free float 16, which has the same number of exponents as FP32, eight bits of exponents, uh, but has significantly less amount of fraction bits, only seven bits for the Fraction. And the total number of bits is uh, still 16. Uh, in practice, using BF16 to train a um, large language model is usually um, um, easier to converge than uh, FP16 and can avoid some of the uh, like large dynamic range or different strange spikes during training. And now BF16 is quite widely used. Okay, so special pay attention to the same number of uh, exponent bits, since if you have one take home after this lecture, um, that is exponent bits is important for dynamic range. And dynamic range is, is important for training. All right, so let's do some quick quizzes. 
just to help strengthen our understanding. Let's use RP16 uh, nice example, since we just trained ourselves with RP32. Now we want to generalize to RP16 as a training ourselves as a machine learning model, right? So let's see if your knowledge can generalize. What is this number in decimal? Someone is interested, you will try on the blackboard. Remember, we have actually got a donation from NVIDIA to give uh, the winning group of a project with uh, Jason Nano at the first place. In the second place, they will get, give us some NVIDIA swags. Okay, let's, let's walk through this together. So let's bring the exponent bits. Um, we have five bits of exponents. Uh, what is the bias? That's the largest number where four bits can represent. Okay, so that's one, 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 that's actually 15. So we, the bias of the exponent is 15. So what is the total final exponent? Um, this number, uh, what is this number? It's one, two, four, so it's 17. And one plus 16 is 17. Minus this bias, you get two. So that's the exponent is two. And the fraction is just putting up these number all together. You have this is half, this is a quarter, so you have 0 0.75. Okay, so the representation would be minus the sine bit is one, one plus 0 0.75 times two to the power of two. Two comes from here. So that's actually minus seven. Not too difficult, huh? Let's do a reverse example. Um, what is the decimal two and a half in brain float 16? So in brain float, we have eight bits of exponent. So the first thing to do is to calculate the bias of the exponent. Okay, so eight bits, then we want to calculate the largest number where seven bit can represent. Okay, the largest number where seven bit can represent is 127, so that's the bias. That's in the middle between zero and 255 for eight bit. Okay, and we want to divide um, this two and a half into one point something to the power of some times two to the power of something. Okay. Uh, it's actually 1.25 uh, times 2. So we are going to um, further decode it um, to calculate the exponent by binary. Uh, we have 1 here, and okay? we add it with the bias, which is 127, so we get 128. And 128 can be represented in this way. Uh, this is 128. So we put it in the exponent. Next, we put the fraction, okay. uh, 0 0.25, since it's 1 plus 0 0.25. Um, this is just a quarter, and we put that here. Sine bit is 0. And now we can assemble this number together in BF, the exponent 16. And most recently, um, there's a new number that came out to further reduce the precision of new networks, reduce the memory footprint, making the training faster and cheaper. So that video is FP8, 14.8. So during training, we want to have higher, higher dynamic range. But during inference, we want to have higher precision. So there is a trade-off. There's no free lunch. You either get a larger dynamic range, but less precision, or you get a smaller dynamic range, but higher precision. So dividing these eight bits, which is actually one plus seven, dividing those seven bits, you have several choices. You can make it zero plus seven, all the way to seven plus zero. Um, 
So these are the two choices uh, that NVIDIA made in the latest H100 GPU, um, which is actually a big, uh, a big a jump with the performance about three times faster, two to three times faster compared with A100. And everyone in the world is running after those GPUs. Um, the biggest rumor in the Silicon Valley these days is that which company, which startup raised how much amount of funding and then bought how much, how many H100 GPUs. And even GPUs becomes collateral for a company to raise money. <laughs> so uh, this is getting crazy. So let's learn what is underneath. Why is it such a, so, so amazing? So this eight bits, we can either divide it by four plus three or, or five plus two, okay? So uh, short for E4 and three exponent four bits, the mantis are three bits, or uh, E5 and two exponent five bits, mantis are two bits, okay? So we use E4 and three for inference of our training. For the forward, right? So it has smaller dynamic range, but E5 has larger dynamic range. We use that for training and calculate the gradient in the backward path. What is special? Um, can we just directly apply like FP32 representation to here? Remember, there is a big waste um, for the subnormal case, which we show in the previous slide. So E4 M3 actually does not have infinite. So 1111 is reserved for not a number. So the largest FP8 uh, using E4 M3 representation, the normal value is um, everything is one here. Okay, since um, 111 is reserved for not a number. So 110 is the largest number it can represent. Is actually 448. Uh, what about IP, IP8 using uh, E5 M2? So uh, it has, it does have infinite. Okay, we use 11100 for infinite. And we, uh, if this is not zero, we use it for not a number. So there is still some ways. So the largest number, IP8 E4, uh, E5 M2 can represent is uh, one, 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 zero, one, one. So that's um, uh, 57,344. Okay, it's much larger than um, E4 and three can represent. So all together, they both have uh, eight bits, putting them up together. And the quest for fewer number of bits never stopped. And we go even, even further to four bits, which we are going to implement in our lab four for large language model deployment on our laptop. And also FP4, can we go even smaller? Okay. So let's see what int four can represent. Um, so the this value is uh, one, this value is seven, and this is the uh, positive number. So considering the negative number, we can represent all the way from minus eight uh, to positive seven. That's the uh, 16 values we can represent. And you can see the distance between each centroid here, we only put the positive part. So the distance is actually the same. And these are the 16 values where int four can represent. And next, let's visit the FP4, E1, M2, one bit for exponent and two bits for the Mantisa. Um, this is the subnormal case okay, where um, the exponent is zero. So it's just 0 0.25, which is a quarter, half quarter, okay? uh, one minus zero, this is the bias, is 0 0.5. And if the exponent is not zero, it's uh, a normal value. So one plus, this is 0 0.75 uh, times to the power of one minus the bias. Okay, so it's 3.5. And these are uh, the centrals that can be represented by E1 and 2. And actually you can see all the centroids are, are actually 
um, very, uh, it's also linear. The distance between each centroid is zero and, zero and a half, 0 0.5, okay? So basically that's the same, almost the same, pretty much the same as the uh, int for representation, except that you're scaled by 0 0.5 and you're wasting um, two swaps both for zero. And you cannot represent minus eight in this case. So usually we don't use uh, E1 M2 representation. E1 M2 is basically in four. Instead, we want to use E2 M1. Okay? So E2 M1, like in this case, this is all zero for the exponent. Therefore, it's the subnormal case. Uh, so we don't have one here, it's just 0 0.5 times two to the power of um, one uh, minus the bias. Uh, and here is the normal case, uh, one plus 0 0.5 times uh, to the power of three minus one, so it's basically three. And this is one because we force it to be one in the subnormal case, not because this is one. So this is the number I can represent. It gets, the distance gets, gets larger on the right-hand side. Therefore, it's different with int four. And we can use this uh, to represent um, uh, floating point, a uh, four bit floating, floating point number. And on the right hand side, we if we scale it by a half, we can clearly see the centroid distribution rather than one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it's one, two, three, four, six, eight, twelve. And distance gets, gets larger, um, has a slightly larger dynamic range um, than using the int representation. The other extreme is using all the bits for uh, the exponent. So E3 and zero. Okay, so in E3 and zero, um, this is uh, no, it no longer have if or uh, not a number. So it is completely um, log representation. So the distance gets larger and larger on the right hand side. So the number it represents, if you scale it by four quarters, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, uh, sixty-four. Okay. All right. So those are the choices we have to represent the weights and activations. And let's take a five-minute break before we jump into uh, auto quantum. All right. Welcome back. Let's continue to discuss about quantization, where uh, quantization is the process of constraining the input from a continuous um, value or otherwise a large set of values to a discrete set. Like in this case, we force it to be uh, one of uh, these four choices. And the error between the true value versus our re representation is the quantization error. Or here, the original image can be chosen from arbitrary values for each pixel. Or we can uh, force it to choose from one of the 16 um, uh, colors. Okay? So this is the palette, which has 16 different choices. Actually, the Apple uh, Neural Processing Unit, Neural Processing Engine has this palletization technique. Um, quantize the model into fewer number of choices. So you can either choose one of these choices uh, to represent the uh, value. And actually, it doesn't lose the accuracy. And we are going to cover several uh, techniques for quantization. We categorize them into um, understanding storage and computation. It might be different. But naive approach is to use floating point, either FP32 or FP16 uh, to represent both the weight and the activation. Um, so the storage is floating point and the computation is floating point. We can use the k-means quantization where uh, we have, say the palette has only four choices and each weight among these four by four weight matrix choose from one of uh, the centroid. So in that case, we use integer to represent the weight, okay? integer to represent the weight. But we have a floating point code book. And during computing, 
uh, we use floating point arithmetic to do the computing. So this method actually reborn the context of uh, real time large language model inference, where the weight is a bottleneck, compute is not. So weight we want to use super low bit compute. We can still afford afford to use IP sixteen. And there are some different variances. We can either use k means based or FP, uh, floating point based or uh, linear mapping between the code book versus the actual number. Uh, so these are, um, we are going to first introduce the k means based composition. Suppose this is a four by four uh, weight matrix. You can see some of them is 2.09, some of them is 2.12. Uh, some of this 1.92. We don't bother to use so many bits, so much high precision to represent these four numbers. We just everything just cuts it to two. Okay, so therefore we color the matrix by using k-means clustering. Similar numbers are clustered together, and we color them using the same color. For example, this 2.09, 2.12, 1.92. We just color them in all in blue and use the central item, which is two, to represent them. And how do we store them? We store the index, okay? So 2.09, 2.12, they're all of index three. This is zero, one, two, three. I have four um, different centroids, and we're just storing the index into them. And now that answers uh, the question you just asked, can we use arbitrary mapping? This is arbitrary mapping. Okay. You can see um, these values are not um, uh, linear, linearly spaced with each other, and each number can be mapped into any of uh, these centroids. You just store the index, for example, 1.49, and as index of 2, 0, 1, 2, we use 1.5 to represent it. So we can use uh, this representation to reconstruct the original weight. So uh, index of zero, it's minus one. So we put minus one here. <coughs> and then we can calculate the quantization error by subtracting the reconstructed versus the original weight. And you can get the quantization error is actually pretty small. And we are going to implement this process in our homework in lab two. And let's see how much storage do we save in this case. So this weight matrix has 16 values. Each value is represented by 32 bits floating point. So all together is five 12 bits and each byte is eight bits. So divided by eight, that's 64 bytes. On the right hand side, we use only two bits to represent each index. Since the code book has only four entries which can be indexed by two bits. And we have 16 such values. So all together, we have 32 bits or four bytes. Compared with 64 bytes, we save 16 times. But don't forget this code book. Each value is a full, uh, full precision number. It's 32 bits. And we have four such entries. So all together, 128 bits or 16 bytes. So put them together, we have 20 bytes compared with 64 bytes. It's roughly um, pretty good. 3.2 times smaller. But this is a toy example where the matrix is only four by four. What if the matrix get much, much larger? It's much larger than the code book. Therefore, uh, we use 32 bit times M. M is the number of um, entries. In this example is 16, but it could be much larger. Uh, in that case, where the code book becomes, N becomes much smaller compared with M, the power n is much smaller compared with m, then we can ignore this part and only use uh, n bit. In this case, it's two bit, but in general, it could be n bit, like four bit times the number of entry. So you compare 32 versus n bit, you save uh, 32 over n times smaller. And how do we fine tune the model? So, first of all, this is for inference, inference part. Um, how do we quantize them? But what about how to recover the accuracy loss and retrain the model? So we can get the gradient as if 
they are independent. Okay. And we want to cluster the gradient in the same pattern as the weight. So the same pattern as the weight. And then we accumulate the same color of the gradient all together. And the red part, we put them together, we sum them, sum them up or average them, and then we get the reduced gradient. We subtract the times the learning rate is subtracted from the original centroid, so we can get the updated centroid. So that's one iteration of fine tuning on top of such weight shared or quantized, k means quantized weights. We are going to implement that in the homework. So let's see how does the accuracy change as we do such k means quantization. So this is the model size ratio after compression from 20% all the way to like 6%. Uh, if we do the quantization, uh, we can roughly make it like 10%, below 10% without losing accuracy. And if we are doing tuning, it's similar, like 10%, uh, 12%. But pruning and quantization can be friendly, uh, can be combined together in a very friendly manner and further push the frontier to make the model even smaller and also while maintaining the accuracy. Okay. So it's showing that pruning and quantization can work together. What is the weight distribution for a prune model? Remember, uh, in last lecture, we talked about the central, uh, this close to zero value weights that get pruned, and then after fine tuning, become like a bimodal distribution. Um, so before quantization, the weight distribution is still continuous. It can choose anything between here and here. But after quantization, we get a discrete weight. Like we get only eight choices, 16 choices. Originally, where there's a lot of weight, now there's also a lot of weight. Some of the centroid has fewer number of weights associated with that group. And what about doing fine tuning? You can see some subtle change about the distribution. Some of the centroids moved to its neighbor. So after you add your gradient to your quantized weights, do you recompute the centroids so you get new? Yes, this is recomputing the centroid. So the, you can see the some subtle change after, before, after, before, after. You see the centroid is moved a little bit. And that is caused by uh, here, we are um, changing um, the centroid with the gradient and we get fine-tuned centroid. So how many bits do we need? I experimented with convolution and FC layers. Uh, for convolution layer, roughly four bit is enough. Uh, that was the result in 2016, but until last year, Qualcomm released uh, their chip uh, as, uh, as Gen 8 Gen 2 that actually supported is four bit weight quantization. So it's still widely applicable even today, even seven years later. So four bit pretty much enough for the weight of a component. After that, like two bits, three bits, the, the accuracy begins to drop. For the FC layers, it's more robust, even like two bits, you don't have much loss of accuracy, both the top point accuracy and uh, top five accuracy and also the top five accuracy. As you can see, one of them is higher because this is the top five, top five accuracy, this is the top one accuracy. There's another way we can further reduce the number of uh, uh, the storage. Previously, we are using the same number of bits for each weight, like four bits or eight bits. Can we use different number of bits for each weight? So we can use Hoffman coding, which is saying for those infrequently used weights, like these weights, these weights, and these weights, uh, we can use more bits to represent them. And for those frequently using weights, like these ones, speed ones, we can use fewer number of bits to represent. So this is good for, if you wanna just to save the storage, like you wanna build an app, the app has AI inside, 
you want to put it running on the phone, you want to upload it to the Apple Store, but you don't want the user to take a long time to download. Uh, this is a good approach to further squeeze out the last uh, last one percent of the last few percent of the storage. But actually, during runtime, uh, the decode will have uh, some cost. So not um, not easy to implement in practice. So let's put them together. That's the uh, deep compression approach, a paper I wrote in 2016, got a best paper award in iClear at that time, and now has become industry standard, pretty much the industry standard to compress neural networks using pruning and also quantization. The last step, Huffman coding didn't get uh, quite widely used due to the um, implementation uh, complexity. So pruning, quantization, very widely used. Original size, original network, after pruning, same accuracy, but about 10x reduction. We learned about the process of pruning, uh, which is to get number less number of weights by training it, pruning, fine tune it, and repeat this process to do iterative pruning from 100% to 70% to 50% to 10%. Um, and the quantization gave you less number of bits per weight. Then we cluster the weight by doing k-means clustering and generate a code book using those same choice. And then we quantize the weights with the code book using fewer number of bits. If you have 16 entries in the code book, you need only four bits for each weight. Four bit is four times smaller than the 16 bit weight. We are going to implement that in the homework in the lab. And then we can retrain the uh, retrain uh, the code book to recover the accuracy. And finally, we can encode the weights and index using half main coding if you want to uh, make it extremely small. So these are the benchmarks that we played with at that time. ImageNet, MNIST. Um, so original model size, like Alex at 40 megabytes ResNet. Um, we can make it about 10 to 35 to 49 times smaller, but while maintaining the accuracy of the image setting. And recently, even for modern neural networks, um, four bit quantization for the weight, or in general, eight bit weight, eight bit activation is still uh, quite popular, even for large language model, it works quite well, maintaining the accuracy while saving the storage and then saving the compute. Question. The right push column, it's after the fine tuning before accuracy. Right, it's after the uh, fine tuning. So, do you think in this space, quantitative method work well with uh, accelerators since, like, the signal is created to be probably, but like uh, for those standardized, the integral of the input of the input and the signal to be standardized. Yes, it works well for accelerators. Since you have only 16 entries, you can put them in the register. Indexing to the register is actually pretty cheap. Actually, we can do such online decoding on the GPU as well. Um, so we are using four bits in the lab five. We are using four bit to represent the weight. We decode them to a 16 bit. And actually, the activation is still 16 bit. And we do the arithmetic into a 16 bit times 16 bit in the GPU to take advantage of the tensor core, but we're storing the weight in four bit and it run about three to four times faster than P16. So natural question is, as we can see, this more efficient neural networks has less compression ratio. Like they are small to begin with, right? Compared with hundreds of megabytes, these are just tens of megabytes. So can we, uh, uh, make compact models to begin with. So actually in the uh, third chapter, when we are talking about neural architecture search, we'll answer this question. Okay, so we wanna first uh, make a compact model even before compression. So this is, was the early, early trial when, when I was collaborating with Berkeley, with um, Forrest and Kurt on this project called SqueezeNet. You can tell from the name, Squeeze that we want to make a super small and tiny model, uh, which is basically before this three by three convolution, we want to reduce the number of channels from original size to a quarter of its original number of channels. Okay, and here we feed it 
unlike ResNet, uh, here is three by three, we use a smaller kernel in parallel with three by three kernel and using smaller number of channels. And after that, we uh, extend, expand the number of channels to the original channel and then concatenate them together. So that's the basic building block of squeeze net. And we repeat it many times uh, to form this squeeze net. SqueezeNet is pretty small, actually. So compared with AlexNet, which is 450 megabytes, it's only four and a half, four and eight, four point eight times, four point eight times, four point eight megabytes to begin with, which is fifty times smaller, even before compression. Um, so I experimented applying deep compression on top of it, it becomes less than half megabyte. So it's five hundred times smaller compared with the original AlexNet, but while maintaining both the top five and top five accuracy, which is showing that even for a very compact model, there's still opportunity to further compress it. So what is actually uh, happening during the k-mean space with uh, quantization during uh, runtime? Okay, so the weights are first decompressed using this lookup table, using the index index into this lookup table to decode um, the weight. And it only saves the storage and saves the uh, memory, uh, save the memory footprint. You don't have to fetch like 32 bit or 16 bit floating point weight, but you, you only need to fetch uh, this two bit weight and decode it on the fly. So it doesn't, um, it saves the storage, saves the memory footprint, but it doesn't save the computation, the computation time, compute time. You still use uh, the full precision. Uh, arithmetic. This is too helpful when the workload is memory bounded, like running Lama 2. In Lama 2, generating each token, if you run in Lama 2, 7 bit in parameter model in FP16, so that's um, 14 gigabytes of memory just to generate each token. You have to reference 14 gigabytes of memory. That's purely memory bounded, where it's very, very crucial to save uh, the memory footprint, save the storage. So we dequantize the weight. Uh, so we start with quantized weights together with the code book. Okay? We decode it at a real weight and do a convolution in a 14 point uh, approach. So the saving is coming from here on the memory footprint, not the compute. All right. So the next chapter is about linear quantization, okay? integer weight, integer arithmetic rather than integer weight, floating point arithmetic. Let's see how does linear quantization work. Same example, four by four, uh, 32 bit floating point uh, matrix to start. And now we want to quantize it to um, two bits. Okay, we have a binary representation from one zero one one zero 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 one, representing minus two minus one zero one. Okay, the difference now is that they are equal in space because it's linear quantization. Previously, it is arbitrary quantization. This can be arbitrary number using a code book. And now we have less flexibility by using linear quantization. But luckily, it's easier to decode. This is linear mapping between um, the central and actual decimal representation. And how do we quantize that? I'll show you the result first. And then we are going to go to very, a lot of math, um, which we are going to re implement in lab two. Uh, but let's see the result first. We have a zero point, um, which is mapping uh, this uh, quantized uh, representation into, into zero, map it to zero. We can think about it as a bias, okay? the zero point, which is a two bit signed in. And also we have a scaling factor, which is a 32 bit floating point number. We'll learn how to calculate these numbers very soon. And using this representation minus the zero point, which is minus one, times the scaling factor, we can recover the weight matrix. For example, uh, one minus minus one, you get two, and times 1.07, you get 2.14. 2.14 compared with here, 2.09 is pretty, pretty similar, pretty small um, quantization error. We can see another one, for example, this number used to be zero, uh, minus 0 0.98, uh, we quantize it to minus two, uh, minus two, and here minus minus one is minus one, right? Minus two 
plus one actually. Here it is plus one, just minus minus one times 1.07, you get minus 1.07. And compared with minus uh, 0.98, there's only 0 0.09 quantization error. So what are these, how is this two magic number <laughs> calculated? So let's first see, uh, de define this representation. Okay, so we have a quantized number, we subtract the bias, the zero point from it, and multiply it by a scaling factor. This is the um, equation, the simplest equation um, for quantization. Okay, so the original value equal to the quantized value minus the zero point times the scaling factor. So the quantized value is an integer, zero point is an integer, and the scaling factor is a, a floating point parameter. The zero point function is that basically it maps uh, z, maps z to zero. Okay. For example, we have the linear, uh, we have the integer representation after quantization, which is the integer, versus the original representation, which is floating point um, between r min and r max. Now we have q min and q max. And we want to have one of the centroid exactly map to zero. And that is Z, the zero point. So how many uh, bits do we have uh, between two min and two max? Um, so if you have two bits, then the Q min is minus two, Q max is one. And that's what two bits can represent. And three bits, that's from minus four to positive three, et cetera. So we wanna find this A fine uh, transformation between uh, the quantized value into the floating, floating, floating point value. And since we have two unknowns, the S and C, uh, we have uh, two equations uh, to solve these two unknowns. Okay, we know the R min and R max. We are going to learn how to calibrate R min and R max from next lecture. Uh, since we know how many bits we are going to use, like three bits, then we know what is the Q mean and Q max from the equation here. We know the bit width, then we know what is the Q mean and Q max. Like four bits is from minus eight to positive seven. So we know the R mean and R max, we know the Q mean and Q max, we can solve S and Z. Two unknowns, two equations. Okay. Uh, we subtract them together, then we can easily get S, sitting factor equal to the ratio between R min and R max versus Q min and Q max. Intuitively, that's the ratio between the distance here versus the distance here. So that's how we calculated the scaling factor. Let's give it a real example. Like in our case, this is the original weak matrix. We just want to find R max 2.12, the R min, which is minus 1.09, we get R min. Uh, we get a um, Q min and Q max. We can also calculate it because we have only um, two bits. For two bits, um, we can represent from minus two to positive one. Okay, so the smallest number is minus two. Largest number, largest number is positive one. Smallest number is negative two. We plug in them together to so get the scaling factor, okay, which is one point oh seven. And the other unknown. Is basically the R. So we know we know the scaling factor, we know Q min and zero point. So we can calculate also the other one I know is the Z. We can easily calculate the Z to be if we uh, move S over here, we can get it to be Q min minus R min divided by S. We run it since Z has to be an integer. Go back to our example. What is the Z here? We pick um, the Q min which is minus 1.8, 1.08, which is the smallest number among this matrix. Okay. Um, and we know the R, which we, uh, so C equal to Q mean minus R times divided by S. So this is R mean, this is the S that we just calculated in the previous round. And Q mean, now we're coming again from this table, Q mean is minus two. So we can plug it in to find the Z is actually corresponds to minus one. Okay, so that basically 
uh, tell you how did we come up with this Z and also this scaling uh, scaling factor. You first calculate the scaling factor, which is the ratio between this range and this range. Uh, and easy to uh, calculate since we have two equations, two unknowns. You know, you know S. You can easily calculate Z either using R max or R min. So now, given the matrix uh, weight matrix, you can um, calculate what is the integer representation by yourself. Two equations, two unknowns. And let's do a little bit of math after quantization. How do we use integer arithmetic to perform either a, we start with a linear, linear layer without bias, and then we add the bias, and then we extend it to convolution layer. Consider weight matrix multiplication, floating point representation. Now we plug in uh, the integer representation and translate by the integer representation, the QY minus the zero point times the scaling factor, minus zero point times scaling factor, minus zero point times scaling factor. Plug in for them all. And then we cluster this SWSX together. Okay, and then divided by SY. And then we can, we can extend uh, the equation here to expand them into four terms. Very simple um, math. Let's continue the derivation. Um, these are uh, n bit integer uh, multiplications. Okay, I'm using 32 bit uh, addition since we want to avoid overflow. This is uh, we need to take care of this part as well, but this part we can compute them ahead of time since for the weight, quantize the weight, we know it ahead of time. The same for different activations. The zero point for the activation, we can calibrate it, find the distribution ahead of time. So this is a constant. How do we deal with this term? So the scaling factor um, is always in the interval between uh, zero and one which can be represented by a integer shifted by n bits. Shift can be easily implemented uh, um, to the power of minus n can be easily implemented by bit shift. Um, and this, um, this value can be represented um, using this kind of um, derivation so that um, you can use a pure uh, integer value to shift it to get approximated value of this floating point value. And this is usually a 32-bit integer value and then shift it to get approximated scaling factor. So this part is pre-computed. This is n bit integer addition, like 8-bit integer. And this is like 8-bit integer multiplication since everything here is 8-bit. And then this one we can use, uh, we can rescale re that to a n bit integer and then um, um, and then scale it. So this part is um, not. Do we have some insights here, right? So uh, usually um, the weight distribution is centered around zero. Okay, it's centered around zero. So the zw uh, is usually symmetric. So zw equal to we can force it to be zero. What that means is that. Uh, zero should map to zero, like in this case, it's symmetric. Negative and positive part, they, are, they have the same, you have the same number for the negative and also for the positive part. And now we are using not R mean, R max, but absolute value of R, the maximum value of that. Uh, so that the scaling factor calculation used to be like this, but now it's just R max divided by um, me So in that case, we can get rid of this term since ZW is uh, is zero uh, because the weight is symmetric. We can get rid of this term and get rid of this term. So we are left uh, over with only this term. And this is basically the heavy lifting, the quantized weight times the quantized activation. This is the weight lifting. Everything is used, uh, using uh, eight bit or four bit uh, integer arithmetic. And these are 
pre-computed. This can be implemented by integer followed by a shift. What about if we have bias? Previously we talked about WX, now we talk about WX plus B. Okay, so the difference is this is the same, same, same. This is the B. My uh, QB minus a zero point and scale it. Um, so ZW is, is zero because the weight is symmetric. So the ZW is zero. Uh, we simplify that by removing um, the ZW. Okay, so um, we have this term which we have derived previously. And here, in order to merge these two terms together, um, we force the SB to be SW times SX. The bias scaling factor should be the same as the weight times the activation scaling factor. And the weight this distribution is, uh, is also similar to a, a normal distribution. So the bias is we set it to be zero. So we can further simplify uh, to this equation, since this term is now merged into this term, QB becomes zero and ZB becomes zero. And let's continue the revision, move S Y to here. Um, so it can be so further simplified where uh, QB is uh, constant, uh, ZX is pre equilibrated, uh, QW. Um, uh, the QW is pre-computed since W is the weight, uh, which we know everything all together ahead of time. And also we define the Q bias to be this constant, define it as a bias for the, uh, define it as the Q bias, then we can simplify it using the same way, okay? This is the way we do. Basically all the matrix multiplication is done in like eight bit uh, integer multiplication and we accumulate them into a 32 bit to prevent overflow, this is the most of the weight lifting. This is the bias defined in this way. Um, it's all integer, all integer. Um, finally, we have the n bit integer add, and this one can also be rescaled to n bit followed by a shift, n bit int followed by a shift. Uh, to note here, uh, the Q bias, which is here, and also uh, this Q bias, they are 32 bit. But luckily, that corresponds to the integer add since the arithmetic in the uh, matrix multiplication, we are also using 32 bit to prevent overflow. So, there's some math. You can watch the lecture again in case you didn't, uh, you didn't catch it. The only catch is here should be um, scale to n bit integer followed by a shift to play with that in IPython notebook to explore this part, either using a 32 bit or actually can use. And bit. For convolution, very similar derivation, I will just skip. But the take home is that it's actually exactly the same formulation. Just QX, Q, QW. Now you're convolving QX and QW rather than doing, rather than doing matrix multiplication. Um, these are purely 8 bit uh, or 4 bit or n bit in general. Uh, arithmetic using the 32 bit integer add to prevent overfit. But to prevent overflow, and this is a 32 bit number, um, an n bit, uh, 8 bit integer add, and rescale by shift. Very uh, similar, just replace uh, matrix multiplication with convolution. And when we are doing the real inference, we have to quantize the weights, quantize the inputs, we do the integer convolution times um, this quantized bias, okay? Um, this is uh, the sum is using uh, integer 32 to so prevent overflow. And then uh, times this scale factor right here, the scale factor right here, and then added the zero point which is here. And finally you get a quantized uh, output. And this method doesn't lose accuracy. Um, the floating point and int, uh, int number, uh, the accuracy is very well maintained, but the latency can be reduced to the left hand side. All right, so that's all for the linear quantization. Next lecture, we are going to talk about how to calibrate, find the mean, find the max, and if you have time, jump into uh, binary uh, representation. Okay, so that will be 
part of the homework, you are going to input dive, dive deep into those equations. Um, it's quite simple. Everything is just linear. So don't watch the lecture again when you're doing the homework. Be exactly the same uh, equation, just translate into code. Hopefully not too hard for you guys. Uh, feel free to talk to us if you have difficulty with the homework. Okay. All right, so we talk about the representation, floating point, integer representation, basics of quantization, introduce two methods. One is k-means quantization and linear quantization. All right, that's all for today's lecture. Thank you.